Welcome to Navara Live. I'm Michael Walker. A little bit disappointed to be inside today preparing for this show, but the consolation prize is a co-hosting debut from Dan Evans. Dan, um, you are author of A Nation of Shopkeepers. I have to admit, I haven't read it yet, but I do plan to because I listened to your brilliant interview with Aaron Bastani on a recent downstream. Can you explain to our audience the what's the elevator pitch? <laughs> I haven't thought about the elevator pitch. Um, no, thanks very much for having me, firstly, Michael. I'm really honoured to be on Navarra Live. Um, so my book, A Nation of Shopkeepers, is basically about the low middle classes. It's about, you know, normal man, Essex man, the main social base of conservatism in the UK and, you know, why we need to understand it. And win them over, I suppose. Um, coming up on tonight's show, Mark Drakeford has announced that he won't be running for re-election to the Senate after he steps down as First Minister. Home Secretary Suella Braverman has called for a group of teenagers to be hunted down and locked up. And a certain Tory MP has told me to solve my renting problems by simply buying a house. Why didn't I think of that already? As we're frequently told, bringing down NHS waiting lists is one of Rishi Sunak's five key priorities, which means if you're watching Rishi, you should look away now. That's because the number of people waiting for routine treatment on the NHS in England has just hit 7.6 million people, smashing all previous records. The latest data is from June, and it means that in England, one in eight people are now waiting to receive some kind of treatment on the NHS. This BBC graph uses NHS England data and shows just how starkly waiting times have grown since 2020. But while COVID can be blamed for some of that steep climb, the number of people waiting has been growing since the Tories took power in 2010. And it's not just the overall list that has grown. The number of people waiting for over 18 weeks is now almost 3 million. And 350,000 of those people have been waiting for treatment for more than a year. So waiting for treatment for more than a year. The figures are especially grim for cancer sufferers. In June, only 59% of people began treatment within two months of an urgent GP referral. That's, of course, disastrous if your outcome depends on quick treatment. I mean, their defence, the NHS, say that a record number of tests and checks were carried out in June, meaning that the cutbacks or the, the increase in, in people waiting are as much about surging demand as they are about problems in healthcare supply. The number of people starting cancer treatment, nearly 30,000 is close to a record high. Um, there hasn't been too much political response to these record-breaking figures, probably because MPs are on their summer break. They do get a longer summer than NHS staff after all. But last week, Health Secretary Steve Barclay had this suggestion for tackling waiting lists. By making use of the available capacity in the independent sector and enabling patients to access this diagnostic capacity free at the point of need, we can offer patients a wider choice of venues to receive treatment and in doing so diagnose major illnesses quicker and start treatment sooner. The Elective Recovery Task Force has identified additional diagnostic capacity that is available in the independent sector, which we will now use more widely to enable patients to access the care they need quicker. Like with schooling, independent is there a euphemism for private? Say, I went to independent school or I went to private school. Um, but while increased involvement of the private sector might be controversial with many people, including I'm sure many of our audience, Labour's only criticism is that Barclay hasn't gone far enough. This was Wes Streeting's response to Steve Barclay. The Conservatives are failing to make use of private sector capacity and patients are paying the price. If Labour had been in office since January last year, more than 330,000 people would have received the treatment they desperately need. Instead, patients face record waiting times while the Tories divot and delay. No one should be waiting in pain while hospital beds that could be used lie empty. The next Labour government will use spare capacity in the private sector to get patients seen faster. Now, one group of people who are concerned about the increase in the use of the private sector in the NHS are We Own It. They're an organisation who campaign to keep public services in public hands. And John Bosco Nwogbo is their lead campaigner. And he joins me now. Um, John Bosco, why are you so concerned, or I, I assume you're concerned, um, by the suggestion from, from Steve Barclay and Wes Street and that the way to tackle these waiting lists is to use the private sector? Are you concerned about that? We are obviously um, concerned about this, and I suppose um, I, I should start um, talking about why I'm concerned about this by talking about some of the people that I've been speaking to over the last um, three or four days. Um, I've been speaking to about 10 or so We Own It supporters who have been on waiting lists for um, things from heart problems to eye problems to 
all sorts of all sorts of cancers um, um, to ju just people trying to get seen to determine whether or not they have a cancer. Right. So it's just been heartbreaking. And it, I think it tells a story of people who um, are on the front lines of this problem, essentially on the on the core face, if you like, of this problem. Um, and it is for them that I think it is really important for us to find a solution to this crisis. The second reason, of course, is that, like you would imagine, um, the solution of calling the private sector in to help deal with the crisis is one that, that is already happening in the NHS. And it's one that is already failing in the NHS. It's quite interesting that they say um, we should use available capacity in the private sector while in the same breath saying we're going to build eight new community diagnostic centers that will be run by the private sector. If those capacity, or if that capacity is already available, why do we have to spend public funds building new diagnostic centers um, for these private um, companies to essentially run and I imagine own if um, past this prelude. Um, I think what's really interesting is that what they're banking on when they say available capacity in the private sector, they're banking on the 170,000 nurses who quit the NHS last year because of stress and the workload, who are taking on work in the private sector on a part-time basis, um, and essentially being able to um, come in, uh, bring those nurses back into doing NHS work by paying the private sector. What is interesting and wrong in that really is that you could use them more efficiently if you paid them better to stay in the NHS or to come back into the NHS. So the solution of bringing them in through the private sector is inefficient and it's shown itself not to work. But secondly, the NHS has structures in place to train new nurses and doctors. This does not exist in the private sector. So in effect, if you're not spending money in a system that keeps people in and trains new people, and you are depending on the short-term solution of using the private sector, you are putting a cap on the number of these nurses that they are, which means you're really putting a cap on the number of solutions you can find to the huge waiting lists, ultimately. Is the opposition to the way that the private sector is used in the NHS specifically, or is it just an, an opposition to any kind of private sector involvement in any kind of healthcare system? I suppose how I think about this is, is one, obviously we don't want a system like the United States, but the NHS is quite unique in a way, sort of being run by the state, all hospitals and, and all doctors employed by the state. In many countries, they do have a sort of mixed system that doesn't seem to work too badly. I mean, what do you make of those responses when people say, look, in Germany, in France, it's, it's not all nationalized and it seems to actually work, you know, outcomes are a little bit better. I mean, how would you respond to that? This um, kind of responses tend to come from people who also don't want the government to spend as much as it needs to spend um, on the NHS. When you talk about this, emulating the systems in France and Germany, you're talking about a few things. One of them really is about how healthcare is funded. Um, if the NHS spent as much per head on um, the healthcare of people in Britain as the French spend on um, each person in France, the NHS would be spending about 40 billion pounds more last year, in 2022, than it spent. Or if you wanted to compare that to Germany, it would be spending around 72 billion pounds more than it spent the head um, that in 2022. So if those people are willing to make the, the, the kind of um, accessions required around funding, then we know that they're having a serious discussion. But Nobody who says that is really actually having a serious discussion because the fact is the NHS has always worked as it is. It was, and you may know this, the best healthcare system in the industrialized world in 2013. Um, a Commonwealth study found this better than some of those systems that people like to mention, Switzerland, France, Germany. What has happened since then is that we passed the Health and Care Act in 2012 which um, introduced um, rampant privatization within the system. But we've, we've also seen since this conservative government took over, we've seen NHS funding fall over time, right? So those two things I think are really what's at the heart of the problem. The NHS kind of framework works really well. It saves money, it costs us much less, it's always cost us less with better results than other comparable countries. 
what we really need is to um, not allow funding to fall to irrational, irrationally low levels. Bring it up, invest within the NHS, and take the profit-sucking private companies out of the system. I've cited that same Commonwealth Fund um, report as you sort of when I've been on, on on television, sort of debating right wingers. And one thing they have come back with, which I have checked afterwards, and it is you know it, it is kind of correct on this point that in that study the NHS was really good at everything apart from outcomes. So on outcomes. We were near the bottom with the United States, I think, on efficiency, on equal access, on loads of really good, important things. You know, it was smashing, but it, it still wasn't doing amazing at outcomes. So, I mean, are you still very confident that that report that found the NHS to be the best service is, is, is a gold standard report, let's say? I think there are a few things when you talk about outcome that um, are really important. Um, I mean, obviously, there are elements that have to do with institutional racism. Um, I think um, I think I've forgotten who, the, who what his name was on Sky um, News earlier today. Um, was talking about other factors that are not related to healthcare that are responsible for kind of the kind of outcomes people are to expect within healthcare. Things like housing, things like education, and the like. So healthcare is often siloed off as an area um, where you can assess the kind of um, what happens within it and the results you get in it, as though it were entirely a measure of um, the, the healthcare system itself. What I think is a measure of a healthcare system is, can you get access to it when you need it? Um, can, regardless of whether or not you're rich, regardless of where you live in the country, um, and does it do the job? And I think the, the NHS does the job. It does lag behind. It did lead on some um, outcomes, if I remember correctly, even in that, in that um, particular analysis, but it, of course, did lag behind on others. And I think it's possible to explain some of those by reference to other social factors that are not necessarily considered in the context of an analysis of, of healthcare systems. On a UK level, Labour have been out of power for 13 years, but in the Welsh Assembly, they've never left it. Since 2018, that's been under the tutelage of Mark Drakeford as First Minister. But this week, Drakeford has confirmed he will resign from the Senef before the next Welsh election. He had already indicated he would stand aside as First Minister. He made the new revelations in a public question and answer session with the presiding officer of the Senef. This is the quote. It's important to have a refresh. I think it is difficult for those who will be doing the work in the future to have people like me sitting behind them. I don't want to do that. I think a bit like Tony Benn, when he decided to leave the House of Commons, he said, I'm going to stop being an MP in order to spend more time in politics. Um, and then this is back to Mark Drakeford. I'm not going to be a member of the Senate after 2026, but I am not going to step back from the debate or stop thinking about Wales's future. Dan. This announcement was fortuitously timed, given we have a Welsh co-host on today. So I thought I'd use this opportunity um, to, to sort of ask you, what should we know about Mark Drakeford? We talked about him on the show a fair bit during sort of the COVID years. But sort of in, in general, um, what do you make of Mark Drakeford's time as First Minister? In some ways, he has been a resounding success. 2021, um, Labour win a landslide. They sort of neutralised Plaid Cymru. Um, he had a really tough job coming in to sort of deal with COVID. Uh, and by all accounts, the way he dealt with COVID w w was quite popular. Um, he's a very progressive person. You know, under under the Drakeford's tenure, there's been a lot of what I call socially liberal uh, things that have come in. So, you know, Wales is very good on sort of uh, minority rights. He, you know, tends to not get sucked into the culture war issues like uh, the, the Tories tried to suck Labour into in London. Um, Wales, under Drakeford, Wales has become a nation of sanctuary welcome Ukrainian uh, refugees, Syrian refugees, and so on. Um, and yeah, in, in some ways, he's been, he's done a, he's, he's obviously done a very good job. I mean, under Carwin Jones, Welsh Labour moved to the right quite noticeably. Um, under Drakeford, they've moved back to sort of the Rodri Morgan discourse and narrative of uh, what was called clear red water. This idea that, you know, Wales is this socially progressive, um, radical, country led by Labour. So this is definitely returned to that uh, under Drakeford. Um, I mean, on a personal basis, he's obviously a very decent man. Um, and, you know, he, he certainly, certainly tried his best. Um, I, I know, you know, I know a lot of people in England or on, on the English left might not particularly want to hear this, but in terms of his, um, the, I'm going to talk about the downsides now of the, the, the Drakeford tenure, which I think can provide lessons for Labour supporters because it's basically um, an example of 
the limitations of Labour in power. So what uh, has happened in Drakeford's tenure is we've seen the sort of the tensions that are inherent to the devolution really rise to the surface because devolution was sort of created by Blair and New Labour to sort of head off Plaid Cymru and sort of kill political nationalism. It really wasn't much more than that. And they didn't plan for what would happen if a Tory government decided to sort of turn the taps off. Uh, But that's obviously what's happened since 2010. So since 2010, we've seen uh, the Welsh government has been put in the situation that a lot of Labour councils have found themselves in across the UK, which is basically they have been having to administer austerity. They've had to be making cuts uh, right, you know, right because the Welsh government budget has been cut by the, the by the British government. And so, if you look back at this summer, you've got the unprecedented situation of uh, strikes occurring in the Welsh public sector. The nurses' unions, in particular, were quite vociferous in their criticism of the Welsh government and Mark Drakeford. You've got the doctors um, recently criticising the Welsh government offers on doctors' pay. You've got a whole host of things that have uh, have not looked particularly good. But as I said, these are the these are problems of devolution, and it doesn't matter who's in charge in Wales. You can sort of inherit those uh, those contradictions. Um, Drakeford himself has uh, a t- he sort of personifies what I would say is this paternalism that is inherent to uh, some of the Labour party tradition in that way he's very different from jeremy corbyn he's always sort of described as being similar to corbyn but he's actually very different drakeford's uh, tenure has been defined by what i would call things like uh, nanny state intervention so they haven't really tackled uh, some of the big questions but they've done things which are good such as banning smacking but now they've done things uh, what really got people's backs up were things like banning uh, essential items during covid which included of course uh, children's games, children's clothes, kettles. And now we have things like the 20 miles an hour uh, speed limit that's been imposed on Wales and um, duties that are being passed down to small farmers uh, about uh, reforestation, which uh, have been (laughs) immensely unpopular. So, um, yeah, he really divides opinion. And in terms of the legacy of Drakeford, I mean, the the Tory vote in uh, Wales has actually gone up very significantly. Um, the Tories won, I think, five or six seats in the Westminster elections. They won five seats in the Senate elections in 2021. Um, so they've replaced Plaid Cymru as the second party. You've also got, uh, you know, as the, as the tensions of devolution sort of bubble over, you've got uh, a new emergence of uh, the Welsh independence movement. Because as the British state crumbles, as the crisis of capitalism grips the British state, Drakeford is again in the unenviable position of having to defend the British state and saying, oh, actually, everything's great, everything's fantastic, when it quite clearly isn't. So you've seen uh, a rise of the Conservatives and the rise of the Welsh independence movement. In terms of his legacy in the Labour Party uh, in Wales, um, it's quite interesting, actually, because his uh, tenure was heralded as a huge victory for the left in Wales. He was backed by Welsh Labour grassroots. He was backed by many of the major unions. Um, and he is obviously still very popular with those um, groups. But he uh, has always cut a bit of an isolated figure within the Senate. You know, he he, he's, he doesn't really uh, have much, doesn't seem to have much backing from the, Sen- the, the Labour group in the Senate who are generally uh, centrist at best. And the worry now is that there hasn't really been a resurgence of the left in Wales under Drakeford. And there's a very real possibility, I think, that uh, the sort of centrist or the right in the form of Vaughan Gething um, can possibly get in after he leaves. So in terms of his legacy, I would say it's a, it's a mixed bag. Some good, some bad. I saw a comment in, 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 our, in our comment section sort of saying 20 miles an hour is a good thing. And I know you, you're you saying this will be a, a lesson to us, so you're not going to be surprised that people are disagreeing. But I suppose also on, on this show, we're often defending things like low traffic neighbourhoods. I'm kind of in favour of 25, oh, sorry, 20 mile an hour speed limits in, in cities and rewilding the countryside. I mean, are you against those things in general or, or, or do you just think that Drakeford has, has gone around them or gone about them, sorry, the wrong way? No, I'm pro all the you know all these pro environmental policies. I'm good. The problem is, is obviously the infrastructure in Wales is so terrible 
you know, the trains don't exist. You know, most, I, from a town of 20,000 people, it doesn't have a train station. The, the Welsh government have cut bus links right across Wales. Cardiff Council are cutting bus links uh, across uh, the, the capital city at the moment. Um, and the Welsh government have done things like, you know, the, the carbon offsetting, you know, so they've allowed big corporations to build uh, huge forests in, the, in, in Wales as a way of offsetting their carbon footprint. Um, and people aren't stupid. They can see the sort of general hypocrisy of this, um, of these sort of what I would call cosmetic environmental policies versus the sort of the, the, the way that the big corporations, the ones who actually pollute the environment, are, are allowed to get around them. Leaders from the eight countries that share the Amazon have met in Brazil to agree a deal to save the world's largest rainforest. But climate activists have said their new joint declaration doesn't go far enough to combat deforestation. 60% of the Amazon lies within the borders of Brazil. A further 15% is in Peru, with 10% in Colombia. Other areas stretch into Ecuador, Venezuela, Guyana, Suriname and Bolivia. Meeting at the mouth of the Amazon River in the Brazilian city of Belém, the leaders agreed to this declaration. Cooperation, integrated vision and collective action are fundamental to address political, social, economic and environmental challenges in the Amazon region, in particular those related to climate crisis, biodiversity loss, water pollution, soil contamination, deforestation and wildland fires, and increasing inequality, poverty and hunger aiming at stopping the Amazon region from reaching the point of no return. Now that last pledge, aiming at stopping the Amazon region from reaching the point of no return falls well short of what climate activists, as well as Brazil's President Lula da Silva, were hoping for. Lula had hoped to agree to end all deforestation in the Amazon by 2030. So what would it mean to stop the Amazon reaching a point of no return, which is what was in the agreement? Well, Brazil's Environment Minister Marina Silva gave this explanation. If 20% or 25% of the forest is destroyed, the forest will enter a process of savanization that would represent the death of the forest. The destruction of the forest means the destruction above all of our rain system. The only reason we are not a desert is because we have the Amazon. President Lula has already pledged that Brazil will end deforestation by 2030. Announcing the declaration on Tuesday, he said this. My government is committed to ending deforestation by 2030. This is a commitment that Amazonian countries can take on together in the Bellum Plan. There is a lot of work we can cooperate on. And Brazil has already made impressive progress in its efforts to save the rainforest. This graph shows the area of Brazilian rainforest in square kilometers lost over the first seven months of 2022 and 2023. The blue bars are 2022 when Jair Bolsonaro was president. Under his administration, environmental protections were loosened and huge swathes of the forest were lost. The yellow bars show the progress made since Lula became president at the beginning of this year. In total, deforestation fell a third over Lula's first seven months compared to the same period in 2022. And in July, it was 66% lower than in the same month last year. It's a decent start, but Brazil still has a long way to go to meet its 2030 target. Despite the drop in deforestation, the Brazilian Amazon still shrank by over 2,500 square kilometers in the first half of this year year. Back to the recent summit, another leader who left frustrated was left-wing Colombian President Gustavo Petro. At the outset of the meeting, he made these opening remarks. We are on the edge of extinction. We need a life saver, and it's in this decade that we as politicians need to make the hard decisions, especially given our short mandates. So what are we doing? Just making speeches like we're doing now? Petro, who is a former economist, also argued that developed countries needed to provide economic support for anti-deforestation initiatives in the region. How much will they pay us for it? Why not do the same as those in the north did? The northern people wiped out the forests and killed the indigenous people. Is that development? Do we have to do the same? Or is there an entirely different perspective? Petro called for wealthier countries to initiate an economic strategy modelled on the post-war Marshall Plan. That was a US initiative that gave over $13 billion to Western European countries after World War II to redevelop their ravaged economies. In Petro's version of the plan, developed countries would pledge to cancel the debts of countries taking on the burden of tackling climate change. Like Lula's Brazil, Colombia has also made advances in tackling deforestation. Figures announced last month showed that deforestation in Colombia had dropped by a third 
over the course of a year, reaching its lowest level in a decade. The progress is credited to the Colombian peace process between the government and the revolutionary armed forces of Colombia. It's thought to be the first peace accord in the world to put the environment at its center. At the other end of the spectrum is Bolivia, which suffered its third highest annual level of deforestation in 2022. Its socialist president, Luis Arque, hasn't signed up to any global deforestation pledges for the next decade. He blamed capitalism for the shrinking Amazon and said this. The fact that the Amazon is such an important territory does not imply that all of the responsibilities, consequences and effects of the climate crisis should fall to us, to our towns and to our economies. So what do the experts think of the summit? Well, Marcio Astrini of the Climate Observatory Group gave his reaction to the deal, saying this. It's a first step. It was important for these leaders to come together, but there isn't much concrete in there. It's a list of very generic promises. It was lacking something more forceful. We're living in a world which is melting. We are breaking temperature records all the time. How can it be that in a 22-page declaration, the presidents of eight Amazon countries can't clearly state that deforestation needs to stop? Another expert is Simon Lewis. He's a world-leading researcher on tropical forests and climate change who has collected scientific data in 11 tropical forest countries. Earlier today, I spoke to him and began by asking him why the Amazon matters to our climate system. The Amazon is incredibly important for our climate. Partly, it is absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and slowing the rate of climate change. It also recycles a huge amount of rainfall and allows global agriculture to continue by providing that rainfall to large areas uh, of, of South America and, and, and further afield. And it's also uh, really important for biodiversity, the other big crisis we have in the world. So it's, it's an incredibly important regulator of the climate and also climate change itself is lengthening the dry season on the southern parts and eastern parts of the Amazon basin. And that could drive the forest over a tipping point, which would release the carbon stored in those trees and exacerbate climate change going forward. And yeah, could you talk a bit more about that tipping point? Because I know the Brazilian environment minister has said if 20% or 25% of the forest is lost, the whole thing could could collapse. I mean, that's a little bit difficult for me to comprehend. Would that really mean that, you know, if if part of the forest is cut down, the whole of it will Will collapse. I mean, how, how do I how do I conceptualize that? The easiest way to think about this is a rainforest needs an amount of water each year to persist as a rainforest, and it's the dry season length that really matters. And there are two ways of extending that dry season length so that a rainforest can't persist, and that's climate change, which is extending the, the that that dry season length. And also deforestation, because rainforests create part of their own rainfall. So if you remove the forest, then you reduce the rainfall, you extend the dry season, and that and those, those uh, rainforests can then collapse. They can flip to a kind of scrubby, kind of um, savanna type system. It's not really a savanna because it doesn't have high biodiversity, but it, it kind of kind of scrubby vegetation that's not providing the same kind of rainfall. And then that means you can have this kind of rolling dieback going further and further from the south and the east of the Amazon going into the Amazon basin. Now, we don't know where this tipping point is. Some people say maybe 20 percent uh, deforestation. It might be a bit more than that, but we, we just don't really know. So we don't want to go there uh, close to that tipping point and find out. How should we interpret the politics of this summit? I mean, it doesn't seem to be necessarily a left-right split, as far as I understand it. Bolivia was, was, was dragging their heels a bit. It's a really important step forward that the eight countries that have part of the Amazon Basin forests are all spending two days at heads of state level discussing how to end deforestation. Now, there's clearly tensions amongst all these groups, uh, all these countries, in the same way that there's tensions within the European Union. You know, we have Richie Sunak, uh, uh, announcing 100 new oil licenses, uh, yet Denmark and Spain have said they're not going to explore for more oil. You know, we have laggards on every continent, and Bolivia, in terms of deforestation, have, have been that so far. But in terms of oil exploration, for example, in the Amazon basin, then 
Brazilla still wants to go forward with that, despite its headlines about saying that it wants to end deforestation. So I think the politics are interesting within the region. But the most important thing, I think, and there was a big contingent from the Congo Basin and also from Southeast Asia going to this Amazon summit, is whether all the tropical forest rich countries can agree amongst themselves to form a power block this kind of OPEC of rainforest nations, as, as, as some people are calling it, which could allow them to dictate a bit more the terms in terms of the global conversation about who pays for this important global asset to remain. And they could potentially raise the price of carbon uh, on, on, on the voluntary and, and perhaps uh, through, the, through the Paris Agreement to get more income into these forests to keep them standing. And they will also be able to, to just shift the power away from the global north and to the global south if they can, can work out common position and, and not have their, their rivalries. And this is very important because what we don't want to see and what's happened in the past is deforestation goes down in Brazil, but increases in Indonesia. And that's because the demand for agricultural commodities continues to roll on. So someone picks up the slack somewhere. So it also needs to help force the global north, the big consumers, to reduce their consumption and reduce demand for the products that come from this rainforest land. If I understand this correctly, when you talk about the, uh, an OPEC for rainforest, that's these countries saying, you in the West, you need to cough up, you need to pay us to not cut down the rainforest or pay us to in enforce a policy by which the rainforests aren't cut down. Am I on the right track there? And I suppose also have the West showed some willingness to cough up the kind of cash that would make it worthwhile for these countries and these governments? I don't think they've shown a huge amount of willingness to, to cough up huge amounts of cash, but they have said that the ending deforestation is the desired goal. And if there can be some common platform to say these are the kind of costs involved and these are the kind of schemes that we would like, then it becomes geopolitically, I think, much easier uh, to, to, to wrestle the global north into, into a position where there's only one option, which is to start paying for this global asset or find someone else to pay for it. So instead of scam carbon offsets, uh, for example, it might be trying to get companies uh, who rely on the rainfall from these forests and the carbon uptake to start paying for those, but just straight upfront payments rather than trying to offset them against some, some emissions from their businesses. Moving to a separate climate story. So at least 36 people have been killed in wildfires in Hawaii, and that's been fanned by Hurricane Dora. I mean, from your perspective, can we pretty basically say this is another extreme event caused by climate change? I think we need to wait for the attribution study, but pretty much anything to do with high temperatures and fires is going to be attributed to climate change because you see the temperatures that we've seen this summer and they're virtually impossible for the climate system to generate without all this additional carbon in the atmosphere. Humans have put 2.2 trillion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution. To put that in context, that's more than the mass, more than the weight of pretty much every human artifact on Earth today. Like we're really driving the planet to a new state. We don't know what that state will be, but we are driving it and driving it hard. And these climate impacts are going to continue to increase until we get to net zero emissions. And then the temperature and those climate impacts will stabilize, but at that new higher level. So it's really important to get emissions down fast and also to adapt to these fires and the other impacts that are coming our way. Finally, forgive me a very basic question. Rainforests, wildfires. Uh, should I assume that we're less worried about wildfires in rainforests because they're, they're humid and wet? Or, or should we be equally worried that the Amazon will, will burn down as we are? and with these forests in, in North America and Europe? So the Amazon burning season uh, is, in a, is, in, is in the dry season. So these forests get dry, and then you can cut the trees down, and they're dry, and then you can set them on fire. And then those fires can get out of control and get into the remaining forest, particularly if it's already been, been logged. So actually, the, the, the fires in the tropical forests are really important, particularly in the Amazon and also 
at, you know, just to watch out that it's coming down the line is because this is an El Nino year, this will cause a drought in Southeast Asia and we will see massive wildfires in Southeast Asia, just like we saw in 2015, 16 and uh, 1997, 98 with huge impacts on the climate in terms of carbon emissions. So that's that's coming that's coming our way unless there are big shifts in how people are managing the land in Southeast Asia to reduce the risks of those fires. Oxford Street is London's most iconic shopping district. But yesterday, scenes shared on social media and the news made it seem like a war had broken out. It began when crowds of young people gathered outside JD Sports, apparently prompted by viral TikTok and Snapchat posts encouraging users to take part in a, quote, Oxford Street JD robbery at 3pm. The post didn't only get teenagers out, though. They got the police out, too, who set up outside the store just after 3 p.m. So that's when the robbery was due to begin. Two young men were detained by police outside a McDonald's, three doors down from JD Sports, and that prompted onlookers to surge towards the scene in an attempt to film it. In response, some store security guards locked their customers inside while other shops pulled down their metal shutters. The Guardian reports this on what happened next. Minutes later, police chased another group of young men suspected of shoplifting, prompting another surge in young people keen to capture the scene on their phones. One man was searched by three officers as he lay on the pavement. An officer was overheard saying the young men were released without charge after being searched. Yesterday's scenes were easily spun into a tale of mob violence. The people in this video were described by GB News host Darren Grimes as, quote, swarming upon Oxford Street shops to try and steal for the hell of it. Where are the parents, he asked. What will the punishment be? But according to a Met Police statement, while a small number of people were detained, no one was arrested for shoplifting or looting. The Metropolitan Police did say they issued 34 dispersal notices. That's a power that allows the police to break up groups of two or more people believed to be causing a nuisance. And there was more from the Met here who said this. Four people were arrested on suspicion of breaching the dispersal order. One person was arrested on suspicion of going equipped to steal. One person arrested on suspicion of assaulting a police officer. And one person was arrested on suspicion of a public order offence. Earlier in the afternoon, officers arrested two people in Essex for conspiracy to commit robbery following online social media posts. It's possible the only reason there was no mass looting and mass shoplifting was that the police had such a large presence. But the reporting does seem a little overdone. This headline was from the Daily Mail. Chaos on Oxford Street. Police wielding batons clash with dozens of youths outside Microsoft store as violent scuffles break out across London's shopping district amid fears of TikTok-inspired looting. This is the video the Daily Mail put up on their website, which they describe as shocking. It's rather unclear what was going on there, but you'll notice that in in that clip and many of the clips we've we've seen um, from the event, um, there appears to be as many people filming on their camera phones as doing anything else. Um, and interviews with two teenagers in the Guardian reflect that. So they have a quote from Harry, who is fourteen. I'm not here to steal anything. I've been raised better than that. I just want to record it. And CJ, who's sixteen, told them, "We're not here to steal stuff. There's loads of famous people making videos. We just saw loads of police and want to see." what it's about. And teenagers weren't the only people filming on Oxford Street that day. Um, I enjoyed this video from TikToker Queen Reen the First, who turned up to JD at 3pm. So I'm here outside JD Sports in Oxford Street and I think something's about to happen. And there's pure press here as well. Look at all the press. So lots of police presence at JD in Oxford Street today. And this guy decides to dance in front of a car. So, storm in a teacup or riot for stalled? The evidence to me seems unclear, but our Home Secretary has made her mind up. Um, she's tweeted this. We cannot allow the kind of lawlessness seen in some American cities to come to the streets of the UK. 
The police have my full backing to do whatever necessary to ensure public order. Those responsible must be hunted down and locked up. I expect nothing less from the Met Police and have requested a full incident report. Hunt them down and lock them up. For what exactly? I mean, it seems unclear to me. Maybe Suella has some evidence unrevealed to plebs like us, or maybe she's just jumping on a chance to fuel another moral panic. Dan, which of those do you think this is? Do you think there is evidence that people were sort of really ready to loot all of these shops and thank God for the police who turned up and stopped it? Or, you know, does it seem like maybe as many people were turning up there to, to film other people doing stuff and it sort of ended up being this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy that there would be some sort of chaos? It looked a bit like a weird flash mob. It, it looked a bit, you know, quite benign. Um, but yeah, so I, I totally agree. It's obviously a culture war issue. You know, as the Tories struggle more and more, they're just going to rely on these culture war uh, tropes. And obviously the fear of crime is a long-standing one. I mean, maybe they're running out of folk devils. You know, they've already got migrants, they've got trans people. Maybe they want to uh, fall back on a tried and tested one, which is obviously uh, the highly racialized and racist idea of unruly black youth, which as Stuart Hall says in Police in the Crisis, becomes a sort of signifier for this general fear of crime. So, I mean, very worrying stuff if, if this is the direction that Braveman and so on are going to go with. Yeah, I mean, they seem very happy to go in this direction. This sort of story or non-story, depending on however we interpret it, did, did remind me of a conversation I was having with a friend the other day who was sort of saying, why haven't we seen any riots this summer? You know, the extent or the cost of living crisis, which we've witnessed, the the, the, the biggest fall in in living standards since the 40s um, doesn't seem to have, you know, created much of a sort of popular outpouring on the streets. Of course, we've had like a big strike wave, which is is very significant, probably actually, you know, it's probably healthier to have a strike wave than a bunch of riots. It's interesting that we haven't seen much of that sort. I mean, what do you make of that, Dan? Well, that's exactly the role of folk devils. That's what, that's why that's why they're, they're brought out. That's what Stuart Hall says, you know, as living standards plummet, as people become more insecure, as people's lives basically get worse, um, it's far more effective for the state and for the Tories to sort of create these folk devils, whether they be migrants, whether they be trans people, whether they be sort of black youth running around in London. Um, and you project all your insecurities um, and worries onto this figure and, and everything sort of gets bound up in, in the folk devil rather than sort of focusing on uh, the real culprits for what's happening in society, which is obviously the government. We've had lots more proof this week that Britain's housing market is screwed. The Guardian had this report. One in three of England's university starters may live at home this year. Now, that story is based on a survey of current six formers by UCL. And the one in three figure is up from 20% in 2019. The researchers warn it could limit career choices if people only feel they can afford to go to universities near their family homes. Bloomberg also had a related story. Um, so they write, UK young adults give up on property to live with parents later in life. Um, the Bloomberg story is based on data from the census and from the property website Zoopla. Um, so they're finding that lots more people um, are living with their parents for a much longer period of time and people um, who are millennials and Gen Z are just giving up on the hope of ever owning a home. Jacob Rees-Mogg doesn't appear to have got the memo though. I was on his show on Thursday night. I also think a mistake that you guys make is thinking that if it's in the private sector, that means that there must have been some risk involved. Now, I was counting up how much me and my two flatmates pay our landlord a year, and it is about 33 grand a year. Now, all you need to do in this country at the moment to earn over 100 grand is own three ex-council flats in a major city. Now, that is someone, in my mind, who is getting paid too much money for not doing any work. And this focus on the civil service, I find bizarre. You, you might say, you've got well, to save quite a lot of money, money though. To... Paying rent is basically a tax because I've got it's no a... choice but to pay it. Um, no, because you've got the choice of getting a mortgage instead and that the person who has well, bought the properties actually, is invested deposit, capital to buy right? it. And I, capital I must a, have a I return. I am what's called a, a captive market there. Well... I think we're going to have to finish on that note. Next time, we'll have to um, get Martin Lewis on and have financial advice for you. I'm not sure how much financial advice from Martin Lewis would, would help me get the, the 100 grand or so that I think you need for a deposit for a flat in London these days. Um, that was the end of a much longer debate about the civil service. Um, so that was GB News. They like to sort of say the civil service is too big. They're getting paid too much. This is the real enemy. Um, I was sort of pointing out in the conversation that one, the reason they have to pay top civil servants a lot of money is because the comparative 
wages in the private sector are, are very high for sort of people in in management, um, and also um, that this focus on the public sector is is really just to distract from people who are making too much money for not doing very much in the private sector, i.e., e.g., my landlord. It's quite uncomfortable actually looking at those uh, stats about living with your parents because I live with my parents. You know, I'm way into my thirties now, and I've lived with my parents for an uncomfortable amount of time. But yeah, it's it's clear he doesn't really know what the reality is. You know, pe- pe- people can't afford mortgages. You can't afford to save for a deposit because you're, you're paying all your money on rent. Your book about class structure, as I say, what I know from it is from your fantastic interview with Aaron Bastani. But in that conversation, you talked a lot about class structure and sort of people's politics being based on their class position and what material interest they might have and sort of how that affects their their consciousness, I suppose, when approaching the world. I mean, this phenomenon, um, which I think is much wider than in the UK as well, with young people sort of giving up on owning a home, how do you think that will affect class and politics in Britain? So in the book, I sort of argue that when we talk about uh, politics and housing and class, we sometimes get confused um, because the the experience of rent and the experience of living with your parents uh, can be so all-consuming and awful that we sort of think, well, it's between renters on the one hand and owner-occupiers or homeowners on the other. And people tend to sort of imply that, you know, if you own your own house, you're middle class, and if you rent, you're working class. And what I argue, it, that, that that's not how it works. But what housing has done is it's really complicated the class structure and it's complicated how politics relates to class. So if you think back to Marx when he says, you know, the working class uh, have nothing to lose but their chains, you know, this was because back in the day the working class didn't actually use to own property. But after things like right to buy that Thatcher brought in in the 70s and 80s, um, we got a, we had a situation where huge swathes of the, the working class population in the UK and the low middle classes owned their own property. And that's still the case today. I think it's 65% uh, of the UK are owner occupiers, so it's still a majority tenure. And what I argue in the book is that it doesn't change people's class to own the house, but what it does, it can give you contradictory sort of class interests. So it can bring different parts of the working class into conflict with other fractions. So, for example, you could oppose social housing being built in your area because you don't want your house uh, price to go down in value. Um, and equally, for the young graduates, who have been priced out of the housing market, their politics are largely defined by you know, the anger and frustration of having to rent. One way the politics of this could could develop. So at the moment, you know, there, there is a bit of a division between younger people and older people because younger people are much less likely to own a home, older people are much more likely to own a home. You know, at some point in the future, although, I mean, it, it could be in, in quite a while, right? Some of the, or some of my generation are going to sort of inherit homes. So it could be then that you, you have this new class divide between people who have, well, would it be a new class divide, but different from the one we currently have now, where you have people who have, you know, moved into their 50s, for example, and have sort of inherited a home versus people who've moved into their 50s and haven't inherited that kind of asset. Do you think there is going to be sort of a, a, a new big divide there, which I suppose divides a generation at the moment? Millennials are pretty united in being fairly left wing. Um, especially when it comes to social issues, but also to some degree on the economy, I think especially when it comes to housing. Do you see that as being sort of like a, a really key um, cleavage that might start to emerge? Oh, certainly. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think what is happening, basically people are living a lot longer. So uh, inheritance that people used to get a bit earlier is being delayed by 10, 20 years. So, um, you know, I don't want people to start wanting their, their relatives to die so they can get they can get inheritance from property. But obviously what will happen in the cohort of young people who are renting, a lot of those people who are at the moment temporarily locked out of the housing market, you know, their parents presumably back in their sort of regional towns often own their own house. So they will at one some stage or another probably get some form of, of money from, from, from the property. But I think in terms of politics and po- uh, political alliances, the problem is, you know, if we if we're dividing the world into owner occupiers and, and sort of and renters, uh, uh, sort of uh, oil and water, you know, that's not really the case because most people who now have mortgages are massively struggling as well. You know, the the interest rates have been uh, jacked up to the point where people are people are really really struggling to pay, pay their mortgage, and a lot of people will probably have, probably lose their homes. So I think the best thing to do is to unite sort of precarious renters and precarious mortgage holders and come together against the marketization of housing because one of the common things that unites renters and that unites uh, homeowners is debt you know you're getting into debt either through renting or you're getting 
you, you, you're getting into debt um, if you're a homeowner. We've got a, a super chat from Stanley Beckett. This is for Michael making Jacob Rees-Mogg run for the door. Too funny. Um, I have to admit, I, I do think probably they did need to go to an ad break. I was actually, um, my computer crashed just as we were about to go live. So I think Jacob Rees-Mogg had to pad for quite a while. Um, so I, I don't think that was him ending early um, because I'd made such a killer point about renting, even though, you know, I like to think I did. Um, Dan Evans, it's been such a pleasure having you on Navarro Live this evening. Thanks so much, Michael. It's been a pleasure. And thank you, everyone, for watching. Come back tomorrow for another live stream from 6 p.m. For now, you've been watching Navarra Media. Good night.